Yep, we're rolling. All yours. Yep. All right. So um, I'm going to share slides real quick. Do you guys see that? All right. So uh, week eight, welcome to week eight, guys. This week does not look super intense. You got some HKS, HEP, and some uh, pharmacology, uh, and a little bit of uh, microanatomy. But to get started, uh, onto pharmacology. So we have drugs and neurotransmission. It's going to be your first topic. So um, getting into it, so <clears throat> when we talk about neurotransmission, uh, the nervous system is split into different parts, right? Like you have your autonomic nervous system, your somatic nervous system, and then your autonomic is split into your sympathetic and parasympathetic. And something special is that uh, each part of, or like different parts of the nervous system typically have different physical characteristics. So the sympathetic for example, sympathetic nerves uh, are known as adrenergic nerves because they release noradrenaline at their endpoint. So if you have a look at that picture, you have a sympathetic nerve, which has a ganglion in the middle. So that's it's technically like two axons or whatever, but ultimately the, at the end of this nerve, uh, it's gonna release noradrenaline uh, at the endpoint for whatever effect or action, action that needs to happen. And uh, as we know that, neurotransmission is essentially neurotransmitters binding to a uh, receptor. There's multiple different types of receptors uh, for not only adrenergic nerves, but also nerves of different parts or components of the nervous system. So specifically for adrenergic nerves, which is the sympathetic nerves, it acts on two main types of receptors and that's alpha and beta, uh, which we'll go into depth in the next slide. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about noradrenaline. <clears throat> so, um, if you guys remember from, uh, another physiology lecture I did earlier, uh, the pathway for synthesis of, uh, neurotransmitters happened, uh, in the cytosol of the neuron as it became packaged into vesicles and exocytosed, uh, into the synaptic cleft. So in this case, we can see the pathway taken for the actual synthesis of this neurotransmitter and noradrenaline. So it starts off as uh, the essential amino acid tyrosine. And through a process of steps, so it goes tyrosine to dopa or L-dopa, to dopamine, to noradrenaline, to adrenaline. Um, <clears throat> so one important key feature of this uh, process is that noradrenaline itself provides negative feedback. So negative feedback means that the increased concentration of noradrenaline would inhibit uh, the creation of more noradrenaline. So it's sort of like self-limiting. So uh, it provides negative feedback, which inhibits the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. So that's the enzyme you see on the top right. So which uh, catalyzes conversion of tyrosine. So by inhibiting that, uh, you're going to have not too much noradrenaline basically. So uh, talking a little bit about the process of which noradrenaline works. So we have three main parts to it. We have release, response, and removal, right? So release, <clears throat> if you guys remember, you know, the fundamental way that neurotransmitters are released is due to depolarization, which causes an influx of calcium, which causes exocytosis, right? Uh, that's essentially going to be the same mechanism here, but something a little bit new is that release of noradrenaline can be triggered by amphetamines. So that's a specific kind of drug, uh, which you might have heard of. But um, because the release, because this drug induces release of noradrenaline, you're going to have sympathetic action, right? So this drug is known as an indirectly acting sympathomimetic. Mimetic is like from mimic. So it mimics sympathetic activity and it's indirectly acting because it doesn't directly act on the alpha and beta receptors. Rather, it promotes the exocytosis of noradrenaline, which then activates the receptors. So indirectly acting sympathomimetic. The response. So alpha and beta receptors are both metabotropic receptors, which are 
if you remember the G protein coupled ones. Uh, and something that if you remember, if you remember from the, pre the previous lectures as well, G protein coupled receptors amplify the response. So as long as the noradrenaline exists here, it's going to keep um, stimulating the postsynaptic cell. And only a small amount of neurotransmitters required. As for res removal of noradrenaline, uh, typically we want to uh, have an effect on the postsynaptic neuron for a limited amount of time because we don't want to just have it be there forever, right? Because that doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of regulating the body. So there's a couple of ways that we can get rid of it. So when it exists in this synaptic cleft space here, it can be taken up via active transport into uptake terminal one. So this is the presynaptic uh, sort of um, channel. <clears throat> That's the most common one. The second way is to is through uptake terminal two, which is a postsynaptic channel into the postsynaptic cell. Um, but the uptake one is the one that it's going to be more re relevant to you guys. Uh, so uptake one is going to be blocked by a drug like cocaine. And that's how cocaine creates sympathetic activity. Uh, because by blocking it, you're going to have increased concentrations of neurogenelin remaining and having action on the postsynaptic cell. <clears throat> so once it's taken up by uptake one, uh, uptake channel one, it's broken down by en enzymes found in the presynaptic uh, neuron. So you have monoamine oxidase MOA and catechol O methyltransferase COMT, so MOA COMT, um, which is which are the two key enzymes, which you should probably know. So I mentioned we're going to talk about the receptors. So this is stuff you're going to go into a significantly more depth next semester. So you're still in semester one, so it's chill. But alpha and beta receptors are subdivided into alpha one, beta one, and alpha two, beta two, and I believe probably alpha three and beta three as well. And, di and uh, different types of receptors exist at different organs, uh, which have different functions when the receptors are activated. Uh, but all of the impacts are relevant to the sympathetic flight or flight response. So if you guys recall, sympathetic is fight or flight, parasympathetic is rest and digest. Uh, so for example, we have alpha one, receptors promoting dilation of the eye, which makes sense because when we want to, when we're in a flight or fright situation, flight or fight situation, probably want to see more, I imagine. Uh, beta one activation increases rate and force of beating of the heart makes sense because we want to supply more blood to the skeletal muscles. Blood vessels have vasoconstriction, vasodilation, bronchodilation of lungs. Uh, so yeah, if you read through that list, it should, sort of makes sense in a flight, a fight or flight context. Okay, one, one thing that uh, you should note is that sweat glands, which is typically a sympathetic response, is not mediated by the adrenergic system. So since it uses M receptors, so we're gonna come to this in a second, this is gonna be cholinergic, which is the next type of nerves, the next nervous system, the cholinergic system. <coughs> All right, so cholinergic nerves. So cholinergic nerves are nerves that release acetylcholine at the endpoint. And this is typically seen in the parasympathetic nerves. So we just talked about sympathetic for adrenergic, it's parasympathetic for cholinergic and also in somatic nerves. Somatic means nerves that supply stuff like muscle, skeletal muscle. Um, yeah, and then the exception is that sweat glands <clears throat> are also uh, controlled by cholinergic, even though it is a uh, adrenergic. I mean, it is part of the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so, uh, so following the same structure, we're going to talk about the synthesis of acetylcholine. So this is fairly straightforward. It's just a one-step process using its choline plus acetyl-CoA combined to form acetylcholine through the enzymatic action of choline acetyl transferase. Straightforward. So um, Again, release of neurotransmitters through exocytosis due to calcium influx, due to depolarization, makes sense. In terms of the receptors present that 
acetylcholine is going to bind to, uh, instead of alpha and beta receptors, it's going to be muscarinic and nicotinic receptors. So muscarinic receptors, M receptor, it is a metabotropic receptor. So this is going to be the G protein couple receptor that we talked about earlier. So MM, you can sort of use that to remember. And this muscarinic receptors are seen in <clears throat> typically in parasympathetic nerves. Nicotinic receptors, on the other hand, it's going to be an ionotropic receptor. So if you guys remember from the previous uh, lectures, an ionotropic receptor is a channel and a receptor. So once acetylcholine binds to the receptor, then the channel is going to open and it's going to cause influx of sodium or whatever ion that it needs to be. And this is seen in somatic nerves, which innovates muscles uh, for muscular action. Uh, one more, a bit more detail is that nicotinic receptors, <clears throat> going back to the response uh, section on the left-hand side, at the motor end plate, acetylcholine needs to bind to both alpha subunits of the nicotinic receptor. So that little diagram you see there, you don't need to remember this in depth, but you're going to have different subunits that make up the receptor. And uh, one detail is that acetylcholine must bind to both alpha subunits in order to open up the ion channel, which causes sodium to flow in. Um, and removal of acetylcholine is something that's also very important. Acetylcholine, when it's, bind, when it's bound to a specific receptor, uh, it is inactivated by acetylcholinesterase. So uh, that is an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. And this sort of removal needs to occur very quickly, under one millisecond, to prevent something we call depolarization block. So in nicotinic receptors and in muscles, we need cycles of depolarization and repolarization to sustain muscle activity. Uh, however, if we have a depolarized, um, if, if you have acetylcholine permanently bound to the nicotinic receptor, it's going to not have cycles. So it's going to eventually lead to uh, paralysis or like a blockade, which is going to nullify the effects of the actual depolarization in the first place. Um, so going back to the right, <clears throat> um, muscarinic is for parasympathetic, so you can sort of understand or guess the actions that it has on the different organs of the body. So heart has some muscarinic receptors and this decreases rate and contraction, rate and force of contraction, since it's going to be rest and digest. Skeletal muscle is nicotinic, uh, so that's just activation of it causes contraction. GI smooth muscle, so that's going to be muscarinic. And when you're resting and digesting, digesting involves movement of stuff through the gastrointestinal system, so that's going to promote contraction and peristalsis. Uh, something important is that blood vessels, uh, blood vessels. While they have muscarinic receptors, they are not innervated by muscarinic, I mean, or by parasympathetic nerves. Uh, so there's another pathway that is important, and we'll come to that later when need be, uh, probably second semester. <clears throat> so that's just the organization of the nervous system. Uh, so you, we talked about all of these ones individually, but we're going to look at it on a more broader perspective. So we talked about how sympathetic has muscul uh, I mean, sympathetic has noradrenaline released. This is this blue thing here. And then parasympathetic releases uh, acetylcholine at the endpoint, which is on muscarinic receptors, which is this thing here. So if you, you guys would have probably noticed by now that there's going to be a ganglion, which is essentially just uh, the interaction of one, it's like the connection point between the end of this neuron and the start of this neuron. <clears throat> and at this ganglion, you're going to have only nicotinic receptors and only acetylcholine always released. So when we try and separate neurons into the release of noradrenaline and acetylcholine, we're not talking about the the ganglionic release of neurotransmitters. We were only talking about the neurotransmitter release at the end point. Okay, another thing is that <clears throat> the parasympathetic nervous system, the, the pre-ganglionic neuron is going to be longer than the post-ganglionic neuron. The sympathetic nervous system, the pre-ganglionic neuron is going to be shorter than the post-ganglionic neuron. Um, 
another thing is that, yeah, well, yeah, that's the detail that we need to know for now. The somatic motor system, as you can see, it does not have a ganglion. So it's just going to be one long motor neuron that releases acetylcholine and a nicotinic receptors at the skeletal muscle. Yeah. That is more or less it. All right. So moving on to drugs that can affect this neurotransmission. So we talked a lot about different receptors and we're going to talk about drugs that are going to that are going to affect this receptors. Uh, so we have two primary types of um, blockers for motor neurons. So we're going to specifically talk about motor neurons, uh, which is going to be, again, nicotinic acetylcholine released. So <clears throat> we have non-depolarizing blockers and depolarizing blockers. All right. So from the wording, you can sort of you know, sort of guess that non-depolarizing is not going to cause action on the motor end plate, which is going to be the postsynaptic terminal. Depolarizing is going to have an effect, and we're going to see how that blocks it. So non-depolarizing is going to be a competitive antagonist. Competitive meaning it's going to prevent, it's going to basically bind to it so that other stuff doesn't bind to it. Antagonist means it's not going to have an effect. So it's not going to have the opposite effect, but rather it simply has no effect. There's going to be no stimulant action, <clears throat> and um, you can overcome the binding of antagonists by simply increasing the concentration of acetylcholine. This is important because when we have non-depolarizing blockers existing, and say you have too many of it, the way that you're going to prevent or reverse the paralysis is by increasing the amount of acetylcholine. And the way you do that is through anticholinesterases. Uh, we're going to talk about that in the next slide, so I'm not going to go into detail right now. It is uh, non-depolarizing blockers are not absorbed PO, meaning by mouth. It needs IV. And it doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier or the placental barrier. And the drugs of interest is rocuronium. So that's short-acting, short-onset. Uh, Typically, you just want to remember the stuff uh, <clears throat> that are bolded or things that are significant. So, for example, tubercurarin is used to be one that was used a long time ago. It has a much more long-acting effect, and it has histamine release as a side effect, which is pretty important. Depolarizing blockers, on the other hand, are going to be agonists at the end receptor. So you're going to have agonist stimulant action, but like we talked about earlier, it's going to cause a depolarization block. So it's going to prevent cycles of depolarization, repolarization that you need for sustained contraction. And it's going to eventually lead to uh, paralysis. And it, since it's an agonist, it's going to keep binding to it. So the sodium channels are no longer responsive to acetylcholine. So it's, fairly ir it's basically irreversible unless you have enzymes to break down the depolarizing blocking agonist. And this is when it gets a bit... Uh, like risky because, for example, succinylethonium is a drug <clears throat> that is a depolarizing blocker. And once it binds to the um, nicotinic receptor, the only way you can get rid of it is by is through plasma cholinesterase, which is an enzyme that uh, exists in like the vast majority of people. However, this enzyme is missing in some people, which means that they cannot undo the paralysis caused by sexamethonium. So I think nowadays you have a lot more non-depolarizing blockers as opposed to depolarizing blockers. <clears throat> so I just had a question. If you were to give sexamethonium with a person, have a spasm first before paralysis occurs. Yeah, it makes sense, right? Since they're going to have um, probably an action potential occur before and that will probably lead to some muscle contraction but you're no longer have, gonna have cycles so that's a good question uh i imagine it it kind of makes sense in my head but of course i'm not entirely sure anticholinesterase <clears throat> so we brought up anticholinesterase to overcome uh competitive antagonists by increasing the concentration of acetylcholine and the way it works is by preventing activity of acetylcholinesterase. So 
acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that's going to break down the uh, acetyl, like the acetylcholine, uh, like over here. So acetylcholine, the way it's removed from the nicotinic receptor is by inactivation by acetylcholinesterase, acetylcholinesterase. So anticholinesterase is going to prevent activity of the acetylcholinesterase, which ultimately increases the duration and level of action of acetylcholine at the receptors. So you're essentially inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, which keeps more acetylcholine in the synapse. And the example of, that we have is pyridostigmine, <clears throat> which is a reversible anticholinesterase used to treat myasthenia gravis. So we're going to come to that in a second. Another drug is, um, okay, so say we have one of these uh, blockers, which blocks acetylcholine, acetylcholine. And say we have um, muscarinic, uh, Action, right? So if we have blockage of muscarinic receptors, you're going to have blockage of the parasympathetic system. So this is anti-muscarinic effects. So, so since the sympathetic and parasympathetic system exist in a balance, the sympathetic system is going to be relatively activated. And when you have a lot of... <clears throat> anticholinesterase, this is basically what happens. So we know that anticholinesterase is going to increase the level and duration of acetylcholine. So if you have that at muscarinic receptors, since it's a since it's a metabotropic receptor, which is a G protein coupled receptor, the action is going to persist for as long as the um, acetylcholine exists bound to mu the muscarinic receptor, since it's not a nicotinic receptor and it works slightly differently. So this means that you're going to have excess muscarinic activity when you have anticholinesterase poisoning. And the way that you're going to sort of help the sim symptomatic treatment and prevent excess muscarinic activity is by blocking acetylcholine at muscarinic receptors to give anti-muscarinic effects to balance it up. <clears throat> this is a uh, competitive <coughs> because it's going to compete with other stuff. A reversible inverse agonist for muscarinic receptors. When I say inverse agonist, it means that it's going to have the opposite effect. So it's the it's different to an antagonist and a, different to an agonist. Antagonist has no effect. Inverse agonist has the inverse effect. So it's going to anti, have anti-muscarinic effects. And it's going to undo if the effects of anticholinesterase positing. And an example is atropine. So myasthenia gravis, we talked about that when we mentioned anticholinesterase needed to treat it. So myasthenia gravis is a, I think it's, it's a genetic condition that results in reduced number of nicotine receptors at the motor end plate. <clears throat> so what this means is you're going you're gonna to have unsustainable action potential generation for proper sustained full contractions of muscles. So this presents as muscle weakness that gets better upon rest, but it's going to be pretty rapid muscle weakness. Um, so the way pyridostigmine works is by, since it um, is a reversible anticholinesterase, it's going um, to, it's going to basically increase the duration uh, and level of action of acetylcholine, which is going to promote more action potential generation. All right, so moving on to different types of drugs. So that's the end of that part. If you guys have any questions, check in the chat. I'll come to it. Uh, but in the interest of time, let's keep moving on. So anti-cancer drugs. So anti-cancer drugs <clears throat> have one primary uh, thing that it needs to accomplish, which is the principle of selective toxicity. So since and since cancer drugs are so similar to normal drugs they don't have they're not like a bacteria which has a you know a very clear peptidoglycan layer or whatever it's going to be kind of tough to get rid of it 
and it's commonly associated with rapidly dividing normal cell populations. So when we target anti-cancer drugs, we're typically going to target like cell uh, proliferation and like the steps of mitosis. So we're going to have side effects such as hair falling out, infertility, blistering, injury in the GIT, uh, the blood levels, are, the cells are going to be different, heart dysrhythmia, renal failure, uh, and you know other stuff like that. <clears throat> So I'm just gonna run through different types of anti-cancer drugs, sort of explain the method of action and give you the names for it. So the first one that you're gonna encounter is alkyl alkyl alkylating agents. Uh, so this drug inserts an alkyl group into the DNA, diagonally cross-linking between bases across strands. So this is intra-strand linking and also cross-linking at the same time. So it can be on the same side or on the opposite side, but it's typically occurs between guanine and this, it generates enough stress to break the strand and induce apoptosis. That's essentially how it's gonna break down the cell and in cells that are gonna rapidly replicate, this is more relevant. And there are many side effects since you know a lot of cells can be affected by this. However, Mesna, which is a drug, uh, can be given to reduce side effects. So an example, like the name of it would be, uh, an example of an alkylating agent is cyclophosphamide, phosphamide. And, you know, trying to remember all of these drug names is kind of tough. So you got to come up with something that's kind of, you know, like, like weird to jog your memory. So this is taken uh, thanks to P.S. Papa uh, last year, but a way you can remember it, cyclophosphamide, fam, kind of sounds like family. So guanine linking, you know, linking, bonding, family, guanine, I don't know, bro. Like you just got to find a way to remember it. Anyway, the second type of uh, cytotoxic agent is cytotoxic antibiotics. <clears throat> so it has antibiotic action. So these are antibiotics ha that have a lot of, uh, that have intense effect and it's generally been relegated from typical antibiotic use since it has so many side effects, but it has enough activity to damage cells that it can be used when you balance risk and benefits for cancer, for people with cancer. So it's just antibiotic actions, so, you know, inhibit transcription, translation, use reactive oxygen species. Uh, so, and you're gonna have a lot of side effects. So cardiotoxicity, nausea, vomiting, hair loss in cells that have fast turnover. So that's essentially rapidly dividing cells as we talked about earlier. Example is doxorubicin. <coughs> Again, a way to remember that. So dox, you know, doctors, doctors, dox uh, typically repair stuff. Uh, and this drug, oh yeah, and another action is the, is that doxorubicin prevents re-ligation of DNA. So uh, you might've come across that in your first cells one lecture or wherever you went through like pro DNA synthesis. Uh, but it can stop the repair or ligation of the DNA. Next one. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about anti-metabolites. Uh, in this case, uh, there are different anti-metabolites, but methotrexate is going to be the main one. Uh, methotrexate is a cycle-specific anti-metabolite. So what this means is in the mitotic, uh, you know, like the wheel, we go from like, was it G0 to S2, G1, or whatever, whatever that was. But it's going to target a specific part of that cycle. It's going to substitute itself in the DNA synthesis pathway and tip and just basically affect the, <clears throat> um, the creation of DNA. So the nucleotide synthesis occurs from folic acid and folate, so it's going to affect the folate pathway. And it has a lot of side effects. Again, cytotoxicity to foster nova cells, photosensitivity can be given to pregnant women. A uh, bit more info about methotrexate. So on the right, we have the pathway to creation of nucleic acid. So that's from folic acid to dihydrofolic acid, tetrahydrofolic acid, and purine and pyrimidine nucleotides. So that's the two different types of nucleotides that make up the actual nucleic acids. And methotrexate is just a competitive inhibitor for dihydrofolate reductase, which is the enzyme that is used to like catalyze this process. So it's predominantly just toxic to cells of high replication rate. <clears throat> Alrighty, so a couple more different types. 
histone deacetylase inhibitors. So you, might, you guys might've noticed the trend that we're trying to target DNA replication <clears throat> and general in, generally induced apoptosis. So histone deacetylase inhibitors is gonna inhibit the removal of acetyl groups. So deacetylase inhibitor makes sense in the histone complex. Affects gene expression, cell cycle, apoptosis, easy. Next one is plant alkali alkaloids. <clears throat> so that's, uh, there's different types of this and it's also more cell, cell specific. So you have mitotic poisons, which inhibit microtubule formation. And if you guys remember, microtubule formation occurs in metaphase. So it's an M phase inhibitor. Topo, it's also a topoisomerase inhibitor. So that is an enzyme that is useful for coiling and uncoiling of DNA. So it, as an inhibitor, it disrupts the coiling and uncoiling of DNA. And that occurs in the S phase. So it's an S phase inhibitor. <clears throat> also for some of these, you don't have examples, which is fine, but uh, you still need to know the class and the method of action for how they work. Um, you should go to your e-pharmacology website to have an exhaustive list of all the information that you need to know though. It's pretty important. Anyway, let's move on to another type of uh, agent to uh, target cancer. So we talked about cytotoxic agents, which essentially just kill cells. Next we have hormone and hormone antagonists. So some types of cancers, uh, especially stuff like breast cancer and prostate cancer, they require um, hormone stimulation for growth. Uh, since especially, you know, for example, a breast tissue is just going to be a breast tissue, right? It's still going to be promoted by estrogen. So for example, we have selective estrogen receptor modulator or SERM for short. So this type of drug is the selective anti-estrogenic action or has selective anti-estrogenic action for breast tissue. So it acts as an antagonist to suppress cancer growth, uh, specifically for breast tissue. So estrogen is known to have protective effects on bone health. So it's gonna avoid if side effects like osteoporosis, if we were to just target all estrogenic receptors in the body. Side effects include hot flushes, sweating, and a memory tool, I don't know, like Tammy's a goal of breast cancer. So you can just sort of remember that sad story and then think about tamoxifen. Next is aromatose, arom, aromatase inhibitor. So that's, again, in the same vein, we're gonna, talk, we're gonna think about estrogen synthesis. Arom, aromatase is an enzyme used in estrogen synthesis and inhibiting that reduces circulating estrogen levels <clears throat> and side effects of GI. Remember that. You know, you can just use, it's A, this is A, sorts of an anastro, and that's like Anna, and that's another goal of breast cancer, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah. Next class, so this is gonadotropin-releasing hormone and analogs, or analogs, which is just a synthetic version of it. So synthetically stimulates the release of androgens. <clears throat> so this is a, you know, a bit of a different method of action. So you're gonna stimulate release of more androgens, with a repeated dosage, which is going to cause a negative feedback to have no longer, to have much more reduced androgens. Uh, another way you could do it is just have anti-androgens, like reduce the total number of androgens. But this is apparently a way that they do it, and it's used in prostate cancer. <clears throat> Last one is glucocorticoids. So in some uh, blood-borne cancers like lymphoma and leukemia, we see the use of glucocorticoids at high doses, which causes lysis of affected cells. All right, so uh, chemotherapy, which is essentially just the use of drugs to uh, sort of treat cancer, has a lot of side effects. So one of them is uh, emesis, meaning vomiting. So we can, we can have drugs that can suppress that, which are known as anti-emetic drugs. So we can do this by a number of different ways. You guys are gonna come to the actual mode of action of anti-emetic drugs later. Uh, we did this in year two, sim one. But just for the sake of actually knowing this stuff, <clears throat> you can have a dopamine receptor antagonist, which is metoclopramide. Again, we can remember it, pram, baby, baby spectroid dopamine. Serotonin receptor antagonist on Dancetron, dance fun serotonin. Uh, and glucocorticoids, which we briefly touched on for uh, blood bone cancers, can also be used to reduce uh, inflammation and also 
and therefore reduce sensory input that causes vomiting. And that's dexamethasone. Uh, another thing is that you might see, you know, naming conventions, and one of them is that glucocorticus and corticosteroids typically end with ONE, uh, which is pretty useful. <clears throat> so you can have more supporting treatment. Uh, we just talked about anti emetic drugs. There's also colony stimulating factors. So, for example, if you have a bloodborne cancer and that reduces your white blood cell, red blood cell count, you can have erythropoietin and other hormones that already typically exist in the body released by different organs. You can have full, full grestim, full grestim, which is a colony stimulating factor that stimulates neutrophil production. There you go. All right. So, we're going to talk about a bunch of new, oh yeah, basically novel agents uh, that help with treatment of cancer. So one thing that is upcoming is monoclonal antibodies. I'm not sure if you guys have come across this before, but I'm just going to quickly run through. You know, the production of it is essentially you're going to induce formation of antibody forming cells, that's B cells. Get it from a, for example, a mouse. And then you're going to fuse it with a tumor cell <clears throat> to form a hybridoma. Uh, and you're going to select for tumor cells or hybridomas that specifically can produce antibodies. So we just kind of combine the rapidly, the rapidly replicating feature of cancer cells with B cells or antibody forming cells to give us a, like a factory for, mono, for antibodies. And monoclonal antibodies, uh, I think they're called monoclonal because they have specifically one target effector, something like that, which is especially useful since it's going to have fewer side effects in the body. <clears throat> so you got a bunch of these stuff as well. So monoclonal antibody, there's another example in your slides, but the main one on the e-pharmacology website is trastuzumab, which binds to the HER2, uh, which is you know overexpressed in forms of breast cancer. Um, so one thing that monoclonal antibodies are useful for is that it essentially only can target that one thing, right? Since it, it has one receptor they can go to. So one thing that you can do is attach cytotoxic agents to monoclonal antibodies. So it's kind of like a homing missile. So you can carry sort of bombs on the back of this missile, which is going to go straight to the HER2. Uh, which you want to bind to and inactivate and also damage cancer cells in the vicinity. Side effects include expense, uh, expensiveness, cost, GI and cardiac effects and memory tool. Yeah. So her receptors, it's just, you know, it's her, not him, whatever. Um, her is in the acronym, of course. Uh, it ends with MAB and monoclonal antibodies. You'll see that they commonly end with MAB. Um, another drug is interferons. <clears throat> so we can change the way the body responds to cancer. So by, or by injecting people with certain interferons, which is a natural, it's like a normal signaling protein in the body that regulates a lot of different stuff. So by changing the way we regulate the body, we can augment the side of toxicity of immune cells. We can inhibit some cells proliferation. We can alter antigen expression and do like a bunch of things that are useful for the body. Similarly, you have interleukin-2, which is another biological response modifiers, stimulates lymphocyte proliferation and improves cellular immunity. <clears throat> So this one actually improves, that actually stimulates proliferation while it interferons only augments the cytotoxicity. And that's actually an important distinction to understand. Another one is cytokine treatment of sampled immune cells. So we're gonna remove the lymphocytes, grow them in a culture, sensitize them, and then put them back in. So that's gonna, since it's sensitized, we're gonna have a more aggressive immune response to the tumor. Um, another type is protein kinase inhibitor. So Protein kinases are just essentially signaling molecules similar to what like chemo, I mean, similar to chemokines, cytokines, uh, and similar to like interference and stuff. So they are essential for the activation of certain pathways and also act essential for proliferation. And we found that inhibition of some of them can restrict leukemia, 
GI tumors and also inhibit angiogenesis, which is the creation of new blood vessels for cancer. Intracellular signaling inhibitor. So protein kinase is not, of course, not the only intracellular signal. So it can target other molecules like the RAS protein and CDKs. And last but not least, uh, you have sensitizing agents. So BCG uh, is a, I think it's a combination vaccine uh, used to vaccinate people against TB. And something that you can do is uh, if you put BCG into, for example, the bladder, if there's a tumor in the bladder, this is essentially gonna cause an immune response against the BCG, which because it's essentially just antigens. Uh, so it's gonna increase immunoreactivity, induce inflammatory response, and then surrounding cancer cells are thus gonna be more likely to be killed by immune cells. It's a pretty creative way to kill cancer. Okay, so treatment complications. So we talked about side effects, but when you talk about complications, we're thinking about uh, stuff that is gonna, you know, change the way we treat the person. So for example, mutations can happen uh, in the cancer and they can grow adaptations to protect against certain drugs. So this um, would result in us needing to have, you know, different strategies, strategies like multiple cytotoxic drug therapy, which we have drugs with differing actions. Uh, and since we have drugs of differing action, uh, it, you, you don't select you don't select for certain cancer cells that are immune because they're also killed off by another drug of different action, which is pretty important. Anything that can form is a tumor cell sanctuary. So cells can grow in inaccessible components, compartments, sorry, creating sites of relapse. Uh, so we can get rid of that through radiotherapy and surgery. Dose exhaustion. So dose exhaustion is the idea that at some, for some people, maximum doses, which, you know, the therapeutic doses, which is non-toxic, is, is not sufficient to actually attack and kill cancer cells. So you need something like a, ma a large combination of radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and surgery to help with that. And then you have this, uh, whoops, you, you have this thing called a drug holiday, which we're going to talk about just next. And it is to prevent development of resistance. So drug holiday is essentially just a period where medication is stopped, right? So we found that this is actually you know, fairly beneficial for a number of reasons. <clears throat> so for some reason during the break or just before the break, cancer cells can stop dividing completely. So it's a low period where they're not gonna cause more damage. It also decreases the risk of drug resistance because consistent drug therapy uh, essentially selects for resistant cancer. It improves the effectivity of drugs because some drug therapies are known to require certain concentrations for maximum effectivity. And some cytotoxic effects still occurs with lysed cancer cells uh, killing surrounding cancer cells. So you're not gonna have the drugs effect, but just the aftermath of the effects of the drug can still produce follow on effects that kill surrounding cancer cells. And that was the end of anti-cancer cells. Uh, I hope that wasn't too much information, but you know, uh, you'll all, you guys will always have these slides to come back to. One more thing, envenoming. I think you guys just did this, but uh, we're just gonna go through some stuff. Like I, we remember like one or two questions that showed up in the exam. Uh, so it wasn't extremely high yield. So we just have some key details that you should know. So venomous versus poisonous, venomous, means that it contains some appar apparatus to inject into the target. Poisonous means it secretes harmful substances. So if you eat it, you die. <clears throat> Venomous, if it bites you, you die. Uh, that's the main difference. Toxins. So <coughs> you have different types of toxins. You have presynaptic, postsynaptic toxins, or neurotoxins. So presynaptic neurotoxins, it's called a beta neurotoxin. Postsynaptic is an alpha neurotoxin. And the mode of action is such that presynaptic acts to stop the release of neurotransmitters, while postsynaptic acts as an antagonist on the receptors that exist in the postsynaptic membrane. Presynaptic neurotoxins have slow onset, while postsynaptic has rapid onset. However, presynaptic is irreversible, while postsynaptic is more reversible. <clears throat> 
So you can sort of think of it as presynaptic having more time to deal with it, but if you don't deal with it, then it's much more severe. Presynaptic response to antivenom only if given early. So it can be pretty dangerous. Postsynaptic, however, responds to anticholinesterases and antivenom. Myotoxins, uh, myo meaning muscle. So it acts directly on skeletal muscle to break it down. So it's pretty straightforward. And that should be the end of uh, this stuff. Easy peasy. All right, so <laughs> farm is obviously quite a, a heavy topic. Don't feel bad if you don't like, uh, you feel like you're not super clear on um, th the concepts and the particular drugs, especially. Um, it's a lot of content. We don't expect you to get it right away. Um, it's more about just getting the basics. Um, and then of course, you've got the slides, you've got the recordings to come back to whenever you want. Um, so the next few topics are going to be a lot more light. So we're going to run through them a bit more quickly. Um, as always, feel free to chuck questions in the chat or ask us on Messenger or, or Facebook or whatnot if you're confused. All right, so our first topic here is skin. So you're going to learn a little bit more about this in semester two. For now, the basics are, are what you need to know. So you need to know about the layers of the skin um, and you need to know about the structures within the skin. Um, so the, this is sort of the first organ that we're looking at in detail, um, the integumentary system. Um, and it's sort of immediately showing us how organs are composed of combinations of different tissue types. So the reason we learn these primary tissue types um, is because you can then see how they all um, fit together into one big system. Um, so you've got epithelium here, you've got epidermis right on the top of the skin. And then under that, you have connected tissue. So you have a layer called the dermis and a layer called the hypodermis. And together, um, they're going to form the lower layer of the skin and their connected tissue. So a lot of ground substance fibers and then specialized cells suspended in them. Um, and then in the um, uh, in the dermis, you can have erectopili muscles. So those are what gives you goosebumps. They raise the hairs, make them upright. Um, and then we also have nerve supply. So that's two very sensory cells in the dermis especially, which we'll talk about, um, to glands and even to the muscles themselves and to the, the, the epidermis itself in some cases. Um, so we have a lot of different tissue types all working together, each with their own specialized function um, to make this whole thing work. All right. So really quick, you may not know it, uh, but you have two types of skins. Um, so you have both hairy, um, which is a sort of the thin skin, most of the places in your body, um, and you have non-hairy. So that's like your palms. We call it glab glabrous skin. Um, and so your hairy skin doesn't have to actually appear haired. Um, it just needs to have... Um, uh, like hair follicles. Um, and you do have hair follicles even in the parts of your skin which don't look like they're hairy. Um, so that's the general idea. It, it's not so much about the appearance as the type of skin. Um, so you notice that um, certain areas where you have more abrasions, the so parts of your eyelids, um, and especially the soles of your feet and your palms, um, they have a different kind of skin. So it's a lot thicker, um, as the name might suggest. And it also has that different coloration. Um, and it has a few more subtle differences in terms of sensory organs, which we'll talk about in a sec. Um, and we'll also talk, when we go through each of the specialized types, some of them are more common or less common or absent, um, depending on the different types of skin. Um, and we'll talk about those as well. So um, we have five layers of the epidermis. So this is your epithelium. Um, and basically, this is the life of a keratinocyte in reverse as we go down. So they're made at the bottom, and then they slowly rise to the top. And we're constantly making more and losing some um, from the top. So your skin is sort of a constantly living organism. Well, not an organism, it's part of your body. Uh, but it's constantly living. It's constantly dynamic. So at the top, we have the cornified layer. So um, basically, the, the life of a keratinocyte is it, it gets born, it goes up slowly, and it loses its nuclei. Um, it breaks, it gets, um, not, sorry, not breaks, um, it loses its nuclei, it becomes basically just a big bag of um, keratin fibers. Um, and then by the top, time we get to the top, the stratum corneum, um, it's basically a whole bunch of what we call corneocytes, which is what keratinocytes become when they lose all of their function. Um, and they're surrounded by lipids. So that's what helps us waterproof the skin a little bit um, and, uh, and give us that sort of waxy protection to a certain degree um, against microbes. Under that, we have the stratum lucidum. So this is sort of the step right before that. Again, we're sort of um, having that transition from a working keratinocyte um, into a, um, a, a, a mass. Um, and so this is only found in non-hairy skin, so the stuff in your palms and your um, soles of your feet, um, as opposed to the other four which are found in all of them. So we also have the granulosum. Um, this is where they actually lose their nuclei. Um, you notice it's a lot, it's like very dark, um, and that's because there are proteins present in this um, layer, which are uh, very basophilic. So you remember eosinophilic means 
pink. Um, basophilic means purple, if you guys have done um, histology. Um, and so they're highly basophilic, so they're going to turn up as a very dark line um, whenever we have a micrograph of the skin. Under that, we have the stratum spinosum. Um, this is basically um, the area in which most of the keratinocytes, which are still living and functioning with their nuclei, actually live. Um, and so they're um, connected by a bunch of desmosomes. You might remember they're sort of like tight junctions between cells, um, which allow them to stick together and allow communication between them. Um, and so this is a big part of why, you know, you can move your skin around a little bit um, and you can uh, sort of resist that abrasion because you have all of these connections between the cells in your skin. And then finally, we have the stratum basale, which is also known as the stratum germinativum. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. The reason it's called that um, is because it's where all the cells divide. Um, so this is where we have um, melanocytes. This is where we have um, the actually dividing keratinocytes. Everything above here, um, there's just sort of living and eventually, you know, they die, they lose the nucleus, and then they eventually flake off the skin flakes. All right. So um, under the epidermis, we have the underlying connective tissue layer, which is the dermis. Um, and there are two types of dermis. So there's the papillary layer, um, which is a more loose layer. So we talked about loose versus dense connective tissue, the amount of fibers, the amount of cells, the amount of ground substance. Um, so the papillary layer is more loose. Um, this is where your blood vessels run. This is where you find a lot of specialized cells. Um, and it makes little fingers that point up into the epidermis. So you'll see um, sort of everything above the um, granulosum lucidum corneum is pretty flat-ish, um, whereas the, the um, stratum spinosum and stratum basale are going to sort of poke down, um, and conversely, the dermis is going to poke up, and we form these fingers, which help us um, put cells which are in the dermis higher up, um, and put cells which are in the epidermis lower down. Um, so we have sort of an interplay between the two layers there. And then under that, we have reticular dermis, um, which is a lot denser um, and is filled with those thick bundles of collagen. So this is going to give us more structural um, integrity, if anything. All right, so let's talk about what we actually find. Um, this is primarily going to be cells, also with a few glands. Um, oh, sorry, collections of cells, basically. Um, so we have something called myosinous corpuscles. Um, so we find these in the papillae. So they're sort of nestled within those fingers, pointing up into the um, epidermis. Um, and these are our light touch um, sort of um, sensors. So when you're, you know, pressing lightly on something or touching something, this is what's going to send those signals primarily. Um, and they look like a little flat stack of cells, almost like if you remember hyaline cartilage, it looks a little bit like that, except obviously from the skin instead. We also have piscinian corpuscles. Now these are pretty distinctive under a micrograph because they look kind of like onions um, when you take a, a cross-section of them. There's a bunch of concentric circles um, which form this big uh, organ, um, sensory organ within the skin. So these are particularly sensitive to pressure and vibration. You can think sort of things which squash, uh, which uh, sort of squash and stretch the skin a little bit. Um, and they are um, lower in the dermis. So you'll find them like almost there. You can see in this micrograph, they're almost at the hypodermis, which is the layer under the dermis. Um, so you've got your mycinus up near the top and you've got your piscinian near the bottom. Um, and you're going to have more of these in your fingers and fingertips um, because your fingers and fingertips need to be better at differentiating um, uh, touch and sensation, basically. All right, we have sebaceous glands. So these are your oil glands, basically, um, uh, as opposed to your sweat glands. Those are your two types of glands in your skin. Um, so we find these next to hair follicles. So what actually is a hair follicle is a downgrowth of the epidermis. So your germinativum and your spinosum, the two parts of like living keratinocytes they sort of go down, they form a little channel into the dermis, um, and then we have a specialized growth of hair there. Um, so these sebaceous glands, they're sort of clustered around a um, hair follicle. You can see there's a big shaft of the channel of the, the hair there, and then all the glands clustered down there. Um, and they, they sort of secrete an oily substance called sebum, um, which softens the skin, waterproofs it, um, and as many of you might um, unfortunately be aware, become very active in puberty. Um, and so they use a type of um, secretion called holocrine secretion, which basically means in order to release um, the lipids, they need to lyse cells. Um, so you'll see there, the cells sort of born, they develop um, in the glands, and then when they get closer to the duct, they lyse, they kill themselves um, in order to release that lipid payload into the duct itself and then go along the, the hair follicle. All right. We also have sweat glands. So these are, there are two types of these. Um, so you have your eccrine type, which is sort of our normal type. Um, and they just put our sweat directly onto the skin surface. Um, and we also have the apocrine type, um, which basically so like, sorry, secretes a slightly different fluid, um, sort of milky, um, which we go put onto hair follicles 
Um, and of course, since we don't have hair follicles in non-hairy skin in general, um, we only find this in hairy skin. Um, and you'll see basically the, um, the structure of this um, is that in the epidermis, we have a shaft, which is more or less straight, might have a few kinks in it, um, which is lined by a double layer of cuboidal epithelium. And in the dermis, you can see there's sort of like a spaghetti ball, um, a whole bunch of different um, cells which form together a secretory unit. Um, and that's all in a big capsule of myoepithelial cells. Um, and these are strongly eosinophilic, um, so they're going to show up as pink on your micrographs. All right, um, few more miscellaneous cells. Um, you don't need to know as much about these. Um, so we have melanocytes, which basically secre secrete your melanin. Um, and these are only in the germinativum. So they're only in the lowest layer of the epidermis. Um, and why is that? Because why do we bother protecting DNA with melanin? Um, and that's the purpose of melanin, to prevent UV light from um, uh, damaging your DNA. Well, the reason we care, apart from the single cell itself, which is not a huge concern, is mostly because we want to avoid a cell um, first mutating and then duplicating because then we get cancer. Um, and so if only the cells near the bottom of the epidermis need um, to actually divide, then we only need to protect those ones um, in order to prevent cancer from happening. Um, so that it's sort of your body finding a way to be as efficient as possible. It only needs to provide to protect one layer and therefore it only does protect one layer. We also have Langerhans cells. So these are not macrophages. You'll notice there's a lot of different types of like specialized macrophages throughout the body. This is not one of those. It's just related to them. Um, and it makes, uh, it does similar things, um, including antigen presentation. So it's going to engulf different pathogens with chop um, and that sort of thing. And finally, we have adipocytes, which are basically big fat storage cells. Um, and we find them in the hypodermis, so the lowest layer below the dermis. All right, we're also looking into access to healthcare. So this is a HKS topic. It is actually, it seems like a bigger topic than it is because in the end it sort of boils down to one framework, which I'll show you here. So the first part we need to look at is health inequity. Um, misspelled that there, I need to fix that. Um, so basically we have a number of different factors which can contribute to the state that we're in, which is that some groups have better access to health care and some, which one, some don't. So like rural people have worse access to healthcare, people in third world countries have less access to healthcare. Um, and we can boil it down to these factors here. So structural, um, cultural, and social, um, especially structural factors are a major factor in um, developing countries um, because they just don't have the resources required to actually provide good healthcare. Um, and in Australia, there's, area, there's groups at the bottom, um, rural regional people, indigenous Australians, et cetera. Um, they're particularly vulnerable. So we wanna make sure um, that we increase health access to them as much as possible. All right, so this is the model I was talking about. This is the most important thing in this topic. Um, it's called the Tanahashi model, okay? Um, and it's basically saying, okay, we've got a target population. That's 100% of people. How many people we actually provide effective healthcare to is a much smaller proportion of that population. Um, so we need to figure out why is there a gap? And this is a way of uh, sort of boiling down what are the things which stop people from accessing care so that we can try and maximize the amount of people who do access care. Okay, so the first one here is availability. So it's um, to the people who, to which the service is actually available. Um, so like, do we have enough resources to actually treat everyone? Um, if so, great. If not, then that's gonna be um, a point off. We're gonna lose the proportion of people of your target population who we can actually serve. Um, there's a few examples of different factors there. Then we have accessibility. So the proportion of people who can actually use it. So if you're disabled, um, say, and you don't have um, the ability to get specialized transport um, or it's too expensive for you or something like that, um, then you're not actually realistically, practically able to use that service. And so you're going to lose out there. So that's accessibility. Again, examples here. Acceptability. So this is one which is largely about like cultural safety, discrimination, that sort of thing. So if you have a service, uh, but people get treated, you know, really poorly while they're there or something like that, um, then it's going to be unacceptable to them. They're not going to be willing to actually come to this healthcare um, provider if they don't feel like they're going to get good service out of it. And then we have contact coverage. We don't really talk about the factors to it because it's basically the miscellaneous bucket and say, okay, well, if we looked at all these factors, in theory, there's a certain proportion of people who would use the service. For whatever miscellaneous reasons, people just don't. Um, and that's where we put that, um, those factors, we put that in the sort of bucket of contact coverage. And then finally, effectiveness. So this one is the one that's mostly on the healthcare provider. Um, and it's about um, what we call effective care. So effective care, um, it can't just be a one-off um, appointment. We need to see someone repeatedly. We need to follow them. We need to support them through a healthcare journey. Um, 
as we also need to make sure we have suitable treatments and things like that. So this is all stuff that your your like your primary care provider, for example, like your GP, um, can actually change. Um, it's about are they giving good treatment to people, um, and are people people actually getting treated and getting cured potentially um, through that treatment? All right. Now the next two topics are HEP. I'm going to run through them pretty quickly because in the end HEP is um, sort of a lot of information. Uh, we've tried to boil it down. This is a pretty like cut down version if you compare it to obviously Craig's slides. Um, but in the end, um, for exam prep reasons, a lot of it is looking at um, the certain statistics. So we'll get you to understand a few key concepts here, which are going to be important to your understanding of the topic. Um, but a big part of it is looking at past exam papers. So make sure you do do that if you're revising. Right, so nutrition here. So um, basically, there's a lot of different diets out here. Um, a lot of them will be better or worse for different people. Um, the things that we can agree on are the things on screen right now. So it sort of makes sense. A lot of it um, is pretty common sense. So like, you know, you want to make food well. You want it to be fresh. You want it to have a lot of variety. You want to not eat a lot of fast and processed foods. You want to drink water. Um, so these are all pretty common sense things, but they are at the same time proven things. And as we're about to find out, um, a lot of the Australian population does not follow this um, in their average diet. So it's a potential area for improvement, a really big one. Um, and that's important because it's much easier to change your diet before you develop a chronic illness than to make um, changes in your diet after um, you're diagnosed with a chronic illness and then try to you know, slow its progression or prevent it. Right, um, again, this is a whole bunch of statistics. The point that you need to get from this is that obesity is getting worse and Australia is worse than the global average. Um, so we're doing quite poorly. And of course, obesity is a huge risk factor for so many diseases. Um, like legitimately, if you go and do research projects on your various diseases, you go and look up all sorts of things, you'll 99% of the time um, find that obesity is a risk factor. It just has a huge overall um, effect on the body. Um, and of course, Australia is quite bad for it. Um, we have quite a significant portion of the population, um, which is obese or overweight. And of course, like I said there, even though we have these common sense requirements for diets, um, a lot of people don't meet them. Um, so here are the, some of the things that we think do work. Um, so first of all, caloric restriction. In the end, um, you can't outrun your fork. The biggest thing you can do for your um, diet is to, if you're overeating, if you're bringing in too much energy, is to just cut down what you're bringing in. Um, and so again, um, Craig has all the sources and, and statistics on his slides, but the basic point that you need to understand is that you can um, reduce risk, you can slow age, you can slow aging, you can do all of that sort of thing by just really reducing the amount of calories that you're um, eating, which are excess, more than you actually need. Intermittent fasting. So this is basically where you fast for a little while, so like say two days or something, um, and you eat a, a lot less any, um, food, um, you have a much smaller energy intake than you usually would have. Um, and then you go back to normal and then you alternate those for a while. Um, and this works because your body basically does, it has some evolutionary adaptations um, to, uh, to make sure that you um, like don't immediately die when you don't have food. So this is, you know, harkening back to when humans weren't able to get reliable food all the time. Um, and so we can utilize that to basically fast a little bit um, in order to achieve sort of caloric restriction and that sort of um, thing. Finally, mindful eating. Um, if you haven't done this in your hep tubes already, you'll do it. It's an interesting experience. Um, so basically this involves like slowing down, chewing more, tasting food. It's sort of like what Craig Hassel said about mindfulness in general, like sort of just thinking about everything. So being very aware of what you're doing. Um, and so we think it might help um, with unnecessary food intake, um, digestion and satisfaction. So the mental side of things. Chronic inflammation is a big one. Um, so you'll, you'll have heard quite a bit about inflammation in general. And so, yeah, this is a, a real problem. Um, which is that processed foods may help, um, may cause um, sort of chronic low-grade inflammation. So it's not bad, it's not serious, um, but it's there all the time and over time that adds up. Um, so there are a few things which can help us avoid that. So first of all, obviously you avoid the things which actually prompt it, um, but we also have specialist things. So we have the dedicated anti-inflammatory diet, which is misnamed because it's not actually a diet, it's just a way of eating. Um, and so we have certain things which are good there and we have certain things which are bad, um, processed foods, red meats and alcohol. The Mediterranean diet is a diet, so it's a very specific one in which you, you have like a prescribed um, proportions of things and that sort of thing. Um, and so that one um, is in the anti-inflammatory bracket. Um, it's a useful one, um, but it's, uh, it's more specific. It's actually also not great for people who need to cut down fat um, because when you're eating on a Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet, um, often you still get a lot of your calories from fat. So this is what we were talking about where a diet might be good for one thing, but not necessarily good for everything. 
All right. Um, so this is just uh, a summary slide talking about different um, interventions which would work for different things. Um, so Mediterranean diet again there. Um, we've had a few exam questions on the Mediterranean diet, so just look at those. Um, they tend to reuse them. Um, and yeah, we, we know that things like processed meat um, and to a degree red meat, which we need more research into, um, are carcinogens. Um, at the same time, uh, things like soy, antioxidants, uh, which key, a little note there, um, you shouldn't be eating those as supplements. That is actually not good, according to the WHO. Um, and you should actually be trying to get those in your diet when they're in your diet, and um, we think they might be useful. Um, we mentioned cruciferous ve vegetables at the bottom there. Um, that's basically things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, that sort of thing. All right, and um, final one. So here, um, telomeres wouldn't be a hep without talking about telomeres. Um, this is a link lifted from Pierce Pingu um, in 2020. Um, there are some things which lengthen telomeres, there are things which shorten telomeres. You all already know why telomeres are important. They are uh, linked to aging and of course, you know, general disease risk. Um, and so we wanna get lots of the top stuff, avoid the bottom stuff if we can. All right, final topic, exercise. So let's talk about exercise. Um, this in the end, um, it's the same sort of basic idea. This is a big problem. People are not getting um, the amount of exercise that they should be getting, um, and it has a significant health risk in the population. So if you're thinking, you're, you're sitting there and you're taking your history and you're wondering, why do we care so much about you know, your diet, your exercise, apart from just being sort of common sense stuff, um, it is important both for like assessing people's risk, like thinking, okay, well, is this person likely to have such and such disease because they are, you know, their diet isn't healthy. If their diet isn't healthy, maybe they're actually higher risk for a different disease, um, or maybe there's something else that I can consider. So it is important there. And it's also important because we can then try and push people towards lifestyle interventions, um, which might help them. So yeah, there's a few different types of exercise. So we have aerobic, um, which is Basically, like it, it's very much like cardiovascular sort of strengthening your stamina, that sort of thing. So things like running, swimming, uh, resistance. So it's like when you're like actively trying to train a muscle, things like weights. Um, and then we have balance and flexibility. So, you know, stretches, yoga, Pilates. So they're all focusing on different things. Um, and so they're all important for you to get. All right. This is just a summary slide. I'm not going to read through all of it because you can read on the slides. Um, but pay some note to it. You don't need to remember this stuff. Again, it comes to just the general idea of exercise is good for you and it can prevent diseases. Um, again, just a big list. Um, so there's some of these are more obvious than others though. So obviously like it makes perfect sense that exercise will help you lose weight, um, but you might not have realized that, you know, it has influences on the immune system or inflammation um, or insulin resistance, or hey, even academic performance. So if you're not getting your jobs in, um, the doom, they'll make you better at med. Um, and then we have a whole bunch of diseases where we have evidence of being linked to potential health there. All right, so this is the basic guidelines. This is our general idea. So um, we want it to be like the, the big things there are the three in the middle of the screen. So like 30 to 45 minutes a day, three to seven times a week um, and reaching um, 60 to 70% of our capacity during exercise. So yeah, it, it like, doing more exercise from like no exercise is really useful. Doing more exercise from a little bit of exercise is quite useful. Um, you get diminishing returns as you go up. So like at a certain point, um, your disease risk and your, your health is not super um, assisted by doing more exercise. At that point, you're just sort of training your body. You're probably a pro athlete or something. All right, and we have non-structured exercise. So it's just sort of, you know, um, this is probably you'll talk about in your, your hep shoots, talking about mindfulness and all of that. Um, it's basically just talking about how you can get exercise in your daily life. All right. Um, and our final one is barriers to exercise. So this is important when we're talking about like patients, we're thinking about, okay, so what, if I'm telling a patient um, and he's they've told me I do like barely any exercise, we need to consider why they're not doing exercise because how else are we going to get them to do exercise? Um, and so any suggestions you make to a patient, they should be geared to that particular patient and thinking, okay, these are the barriers for this patient and this is how we're going to overcome them um, for this patient and help them.